Good morning. Good to see see all of you. There are some new faces. I just came back from Korea. I went there to attend to actually uh, to attend my father-in-law's funeral, and my wife is still there. Thank you for your prayer and uh, words of uh, comfort and encouragement. <coughs> um, yeah, we are back to Romans. We we covered Romans uh, chapters uh, uh, up to chapter eight um, during the summer. So we will go through the second part of Romans all the way to chapter sixteen. Okay, uh, let me pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, here we are because you, you brought us to worship you. You chose us to be in your presence this morning. We could have been somewhere else, but you um, chose us and brought us here to bless us and to give us your word. So here we sitting and standing worshiping you. Lord, come to us very personally and speak to us. Open our hearts to you. Help us to lay down <coughs> all the things, all the burdens, all the thoughts and concerns and cares in our hearts. Because we can focus on you, focus on uh, listening to you. Thank you for uh, raising me as you, your chosen um, instrument. Please use me to speak your word to your people. Help us to know who really you are and who, who we are. So we can have a right perspective of uh, everything in true knowledge and truth. Lord, uh, fill me with you, with your grace and spirit. <coughs> and reveal you uh, through, through my talk this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, it. amen. The title I chose for my message is, as you see, Who Are You, O oh Man? Hmm? If, really who, if you, we really know who we are, hmm? uh, actually, if we, if we really know who, who God is, also who I am, who we are, then many, many problems will be solved. <coughs> So we many we carry a lot of uh, questions and problems because we really do not know who God is hmm, and who we are. Hmm? Uh, four months ago, in in May, when we started the Roman study, I gave a brief introduction. Hmm? In the introductory session, I mentioned that there was a tension between the Jewish and Gentile believers in the in the church at Rome. The Jews, the Jews started the Roman Church, but they were thrown out of Rome by the emperor's edict. Later, the Gentiles had to take, take it over. But another emperor came, then the Jews were allowed to come back. So they, they came back to Rome. So all this created a tension and was confusion in the Roman Church. In the absence of a, of Jews from Rome and Jewish believers from the Roman Church, there had arisen among the Gentile believers a kind of new attitude toward the Jews, even a new teaching of a most dangerous kind. Their expulsion was interpreted as a symptom of a divine rejection. <laughs> also, of, of the replacement of Israel as the people of God by the church, largely com uh, composed of largely Gentiles, a new Israel. Even today, the replacement theology, do you know what replacement theology is? Basically, uh, repla replacement theology is actually uh, the uh, adherents believe that church 
has replaced Israel as the primary means by which the world is blessed by God's work. The Jews are no longer God's chosen people, and God does not have a specific future plans for the nation of Israel, but for the Christian church. This is uh, basically the point of replacement theology. Even today, this replacement theology is adhered by many theologians and church leaders and pastors and Christians. I confess that unknowingly, unwittingly, I have believed and practiced uh, this uh, replacement theology over 30 years. Chapters 9, 10, 11 are not each chapters. We had a Bible study this uh, past Friday. I know some of you maybe were confused. Some of you did not quite understand what this um, Paul talked about in chapter 9. <coughs> These seem to be an un seem, seem to be unnecessary uh, parentheses which many uh, preachers and people skip reading and preaching. Skipping these troublesome chapters and jumping over to chapter 12 to all the way to 16, uh, where Paul talks about the practical aspect of a Christian life, seems to be a, a better flow. <laughs> However, Paul included, included these three chapters. We have to know why. <laughs> we don't understand why he, he did it. If you see the whole letter of Romans, from the beginning. <clears throat> in chapter 1, Paul describes the sin in the Gentile, among the Gentiles. In chapters 2 and 3, he talked about sin in the Jew. In chapters 4 to 8, he showed salvation for the Gentile. Having dealt with the salvation for the Gentile first, Paul had to go on to talk of salvation for the Jew. So chapters 9, 10, 11 had to come in. In these three chapters, Paul describes God's plan, God's plan for the Jews. Their, their past rejection by God, their present responsibility to believe in Jesus, and their future restoration. So in these three chapters, Paul is talking about these, these, these three things. The Jews were once chosen by God, but they seem to be, it seems that they were rejected, abandoned. Will the Jews ever get saved? Will they get back to God's blessings once again? Have they any future, or are they just to finish to with, to be pushed to, to the corner, of, corner around, the, around the earth when they rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ? The people of Israel were chosen by God, but they are not enjoying God's blessing. They had been scattered around the world, suffering all kinds of trials over uh, many thousand years. Even this past century, six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. How do they fit in God's redemptive history now? We'll begin to deal with the problem of problem by looking first at Paul's deep and personal sorrow and agony about the situation of the Jews. In verse 1, Paul said, um, I, I speak the truth in Christ. He spoke very truthfully in Christ. Look at verse 2 and 3. He confessed, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. In the previous chapter, chapter 8, Paul sang a song of victory, calling God Abba Father. He said, in all... <clears throat> No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. <clears throat> and nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. 
But when he thought about the Jews, the people of his own race, they seem to have been got separated uh, from, <coughs> from the love of God. <laughs> For Paul, this was a very personal and acute issue. He was a Jew. He did not cease to be a Jew after he accepted Christ. He did not say, I'm no longer a Jew. Now I'm a Christian. He was still a Jew, but uh, actually he was a Christian Jew. When he saw his own relatives and friends out of God's blessings, that was a big problem, as it would be to anyone. If you become a Christian, and you have close friends and family members, relatives, who do not know Christ, it becomes sheer agony to you. Hmm? It should be. Hmm? It is natural to have a, have a greater compassion to save those who are nearest to you, those who share your own background, your own nationality, <laughs> your own, those who share your own flesh and blood. <clears throat> I have to confess, even after living almost 30 years here in Canada, I still find myself cheering Korean team to win in soccer games, and my heart goes to North Koreans whenever I hear about their sufferings. I cannot deny this. I can deny my natural I could, uh, feelings to the, <coughs> the country I, I grew up. I spent my 27 years there. I just uh, came back from Korea, as I said. When I go back, all the memories, you know, come back, and I love <coughs> Korean food. I went to karaoke, and I sang Korean songs, and... <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I love mountains in Korea. Here, here, so flat here. That's what, what I, I miss is when I think about Korea. If we have no, no agony or sorrow, over your unbelieving friends and relatives. But you want to be a missionary. <laughs> you have no heart, you have no compassion for people around you, but you want to be a missionary to Africa someday. <laughs> I think there's something wrong, something not quite right. Being a missionary is good, but I think um, we should have uh, it's compassion for those who, who are close to us first. Then we can be a wonderful missionary hmm, to people you know, who are hmm, different from me. <coughs> How much greater an agony that would be if our beloved ones had had unique opportunities, privileges, and blessings from God, and then turn, down, and turn them down, and were just right out of them. Paul made a list of uh, the special blessings God had given to the people of Israel <laughs> in verse 4 and 5. <laughs> Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them it traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, of, of the Christ. <coughs> God did not distribute all these spiritual gifts to different nations. The covenants to Israel, the Ten Commandments to China, to temple worship to England. He did not do that. He gave all, all of these blessings to one nation, Israel. The tragedy is that every one of those, those things they took and they <coughs> threw back in God's face. When God sent his only son, Jesus, to them, they took him and crucified him the, and threw him outside of Jerusalem. God gave, then God gave, gave out all these things, all the promises and the sonship and the glory and Christ himself to the Gentiles. He never gave up on his uh, uh, plan of redemption. He turned to the Gentiles. <coughs> Can you imagine the sorrow, 
and unceasing anguish in Paul's heart. Do you understand? Do you have such sorrow and anguish in your heart for certain people? Even for some people, some of you may have uh, those emotions over yourself. <laughs> How far did uh, Paul's compassion and anguish go? <clears throat> he said, I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people. I know how many people rise to the heights of hmm, love like this. Not many. Hmm. There are a few people in the Bible. Like Moses had this kind of compassion for the sinful people of Israel. Hmm. He said one day, he prayed, Lord, if you want to forgive these people, Israel, blot me out of, the, out of your book. Take my name out of your book of life. Hmm. Paul has such prayer, such anguish, and Christ himself was accursed of God and cut off from the love of the Father, and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Actually, God would not let Paul or Moses do what they wished, but he let his son, Jesus, be cursed and separate from his love because he knew that there was the only way we could be saved. <clears throat> what, is, what is the right reaction? What right kind of right response when we are called, when we are chosen by God? We should say like this, I wish I could switch places with you. I wish I could somehow get you in God's blessings, even if it meant I had to be out of it. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, chapter 9, he, he mentioned earlier, in chapter 8 briefly, by chapter 9 to 11, Paul talks about predestination. But this idea of a concept of predestination, the calling and choice of God, has twisted many people's minds, Christian mind, so that their attitude toward others has been one of conceit or pride. I have been called and you haven't. And we feel fortunate to be Christians and saved while Others have no such, such, no such fortune. <clears throat> and you don't have uh, real compassion and sorrow over others who have no calling, who, have, who are not, uh, not quite saved yet. <clears throat> the right response to predestination is to say, I just wish I could swap with those who haven't accepted God's call. This is true love and compassion. While reading Paul's letter at this point, someone might say that God's promises had failed. See what happened? God's word has failed. His promises have not been fulfilled, have not been kept. What was Paul's answer? Look at verse 6. It's not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. <laughs> Not because they are his descendants, are they all Abraham's children? The answer is that God never made promises to all the Jews, but only to some of them. <laughs> One of the fundamental and fatal mistakes the Jews have made is the assumption that God's promises apply to all the Jews, all the descendants of, physical descendants of Abraham. They only apply to a handful of them. Later, Isaiah mentioned a remnant. The others could have, could have shared the promise, but they didn't. Not only the Jews, but also some people even out there think like this, even now. People think because their parents or their grandparents are wonderful Christians, then I'm all right. I have a ticket to heaven. But only those who share Abraham's spiritual qualities and characters receive the promises, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. He mentioned this in chapter 4. Paul illustrates this from two specific cases in the history of Israel. First one is Abraham and his son Isaac. I'll give you one quiz. Hmm? I have a prize. I brought candies from Korea. How many sons did Abraham have? Two? Wrong. Hmm? Three? Wrong. Hmm? 
I know we are Abraham's children spiritually. How many sons did Abraham have? You cannot just say one, two, three, four. <laughs> I have a candy in my bag. So. Okay. I have, okay, let me ask how many wives did he have? How many women did he have in his life and have children by? Huh? Okay, three. That's correct. Hmm? How many children, how many sons did he have? So far, no one. I have to read the Bible more. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> okay, first son was uh, Ishmael. Second son was uh, Isaac. And then when his uh, wife Sarah died later, Abraham took another woman as his wife. Do you know her, her name? You said uh, three wives. Katura. Okay, Andy, I, I'll give some candy later. <laughs> Katura. Okay, how many, how many sons did he have by Katura? And you're very close. We said the seven altogether. Okay. He had uh, six sons by Katura. So Abraham had altogether eight, eight sons. I don't know, the daughters were not even counted. <laughs> I'm not sure if he had any daughter. Read uh, Genesis chapter 24 later, okay? But only one received the promise out of eight. <coughs> Why? Because only that one, only one had been born according to God's will. So here we see a picture. Only those who are in God's will will inherit the promise. God's promise work, promises work when you are in, in his will. They do not work outside it. So Isaac was the, on, the only one to inherit because he was born according to God's will. Someone may say, okay, Isaac received the promise because he was the, he was the only one born by Abraham's uh, real wife, the first wife, Sarah. Is it true? Then what about the next generation children? The twin, twins born by the same parents, Isaac and Rebecca. Both Esau and Jacob were full-blood children of the same parents, born on the same day, at the same time, actually with 20 minutes difference. Hmm? Only one received the promise. Which, which of these two twin brothers inherited God's promises? The young one, Jacob. Even though Esau should have been the one to inherit the promise, because he was slightly older, Jacob was the one who inherited the, the promise. Because God had chosen him. God planned it before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad. So it had nothing to do with the sort of the life, life they lived. <laughs> it was entirely by God's choice. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? I know some of you may say, many people in, in, in Paul's time thought God was uh, not just because uh, if by God's choice, one was chosen, one was not. <clears throat> Is it not unjust of God to say, I love Jacob, but I hate Esau? Is it unfair of God to say, I will have Isaac and not Ishmael? Is it not unfair of God to choose only certain Jews, not all of them? Since it is obviously a matter of his choice, God's choice, and not of theirs. <laughs> what was Paul's answer? He said, is God unjust? He said, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Actually, later he says, he, he tacked it by saying, a person who accuse, accuses God of being unjust or unfair does not really, does not know God at all. <laughs> God is just and righteous. He will never do anything unfair. 
our forefather Abraham said of God when he heard about the impending judgment on Sodom. He said, will not the judge of the earth do right? He is the judge of all the earth. As the judge of all the earth, he does right things. He cannot do wrong. A person who says that it is unfair of God to choose some and not others has overlooked the fact that it is not fair for God to choose any. None of us deserves to be chosen by God. Not one person in this world on earth deserves to go to heaven. In chapter 3, Paul declared, all, whether we are Jews or Gentiles, are under God's wrath, righteous judgment. There's no one good, no one righteous. If anyone do go to heaven, it's not injustice. It is of God's mercy and his mercy alone. To talk of justice and injustice when we all des deserve to go to hell is quite beyond the point. It is God's right to do what he wills with all, with all he has, with what he has. Are you, do you know the parable of the tenants uh, in the, in the uh, parable of the workers in the vineyard? Uh, in Matthew chapter 20, people were not employed, so they were hanging around, walking around, standing around in the marketplace. And uh, this wonderful master came and hired some at 9 a.m. And then he went back to the market. There were still people were standing there. He hired more and sent them to his vineyard. And 5 p.m., right, even before even 5 p.m., there were still people standing there looking for a job, hang, doing nothing, standing around. And the master called them and sent them to, to the vineyard. And at the 6 p.m., this last group worked only one hour. Hmm? They, they just about start to work, and then they heard the bell ringing. And then they got paycheck first. Everybody got same wage, one denarius, one, one day's wage. And the, those who came first time, first at nine o'clock, who worked so hard, came and grumbled. It's not fair. We worked all, all day under the hot sun. These guys came just at 5 p.m. and worked just one hour. And you treat us in the same way? What did, uh, do you know what did the master say? He said, don't I have the right, right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? We have no right to tell God what to do. We have no right to say, we deserve more than they do, and, and uh, we'll not come to heaven at all if we don't put in all, all of them, <laughs> all of us. Paul quoted what God had had said to Moses in Exodus, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. In other words, hey Moses, you leave me alone to decide whom I have mercy upon. <laughs> it's not a question of justice or injustice. It is God's mercy that he chooses anyone. Salvation, Paul said in 16, does not depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. It is perfectly just if God chooses a person to demonstrate his wrath and power to destroy. For example, he demonstrated his justice in choosing Pharaoh to be an example for all time of his wrath and power to destroy. Actually, if you didn't read the stories in Exodus, Pharaoh deserved it. Remember what Pharaoh said to Moses? Who is God that I should obey him? Ten times, God in his patience said to Pharaoh, let my people go. But ten times, Pharaoh said no. But don't misunderstand, God 
hardened his heart just one-sidedly when he was good. If you read Exodus carefully, Pharaoh hardened his, his own heart seven times. The word, the phrase, God hardened his heart, appeared only later. He did only four times. Pharaoh himself hardened his own heart seven times. Then God helped him down the road he had chosen by hardening his heart for him for the final fall. There is nothing unjust about this. Now we, and many of us have the kind of mentality that, that thinks that man have a certain entitlement before God. But actually, if you really know who we are, who God is, all of us deserve to be treated as Pharaoh was. All of us deserve to be vassals of wrath because of our sins. No exception. Many people believe in man's free will. These days, we talk a lot about our human rights, but not so much God's right and God's free will. God has free will. What does it mean that God has free will? This means he is absolutely free to do whatever he desires to do. He is absolutely free to choose anyone either for mercy or for justice and power. <laughs> At this point, some of you may object, saying, all right, if it is God's will, he cannot blame me if I'm not one of, the, one of his children. If God has not chosen me, well, who can resist God's will? If he decides everything that you cannot blame me for not being a Christian. You cannot blame me. You cannot blame me for the, for the evil things I do. It would be unfair to send me to hell. You know, we, we, we develop this kind of uh, you know, thoughts. Sinful men tend to rationalize their sins and blame someone else for their uh, wrongdoings. I'd like to uh, give some example. <laughs> Andy and Jennifer have two children. <laughs> one of them name is Isaiah. <laughs> I heard one day he said to his parents, when he heard about his sister being honest, to, um, so something happened at school, and then she spoke very truthfully <laughs> to the teachers. And later Isaiah said, <laughs> I, Isaiah, Isaiah said, uh, I cannot but lie because I was not baptized. <laughs> he, in his mind, he, he thought I, her sis, his sister was able to say <laughs> honestly because uh, <laughs> she was baptized. But he said, oh, I cannot but lie. I cannot stop lying because I'm not baptized. <laughs> you know, even little child uh, have such a mentality. <laughs> And Isaiah needs to be baptized soon. <laughs> <coughs> then he cannot rationalize. He cannot justify. <laughs> Can you really excuse our responsibility for our sins? When God works in, in my life according to his free will. The Bible clearly says on this point, that we are responsible for our sins, not God. Hmm? Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 says, the one who sins will be the one who dies. Each will die for his own sin. Hmm? His free will, God's free will, does not mean that you are not responsible. Hmm? We know deep in our hearts that we are responsible for our wrongdoings. But for a long time, till I, I, count, I was kind of deceived. I, I could not accept this truth. I was so fatalistic about my, myself, my life, that I blamed God for what I was. <coughs> I thought I had become what I was, not by my choice. So I did not want to take the full responsibility for the choices I made, despite the certain natural inclination in me. 
Basically, I wanted to say, it's not my fault. God, it is your fault. You made a mistake. I carried uh, such a mentality, and I carried many questions inside, and raised, raised questions whenever I, I, I failed. What does Paul say to people like me? Who are you? Oh, who are you, old man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed to say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? To this very question, why, why did, you me, did you make me like this? This is the very question I, I raised. I threw to God <clears throat> hundreds, hundreds of times. I did not choose uh, myself. Paul goes on saying, does not the potter have the right to make out of the some lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? It is very true that God is the creator and he is the potter and we are the clay. God spin the lump of clay and shaped each of us the way we are and the way we look. <laughs> we are very unique. Each of us is very unique in God's eyes. We don't have to be someone else. We don't have to envy others. I don't have to be six, six foot tall, handsome looking, well built and handsome to be loved by God. God loves me perfectly just as I am. <laughs> Shorter than many of you. Girls and women here, women, you don't have to look like Marilyn Monroe to be loved by men. You know, Marilyn Monroe is a symbol of uh, hmm? women's beauty. They even built even uh, a, a condominium hmm? after her, her body shape. I know someone who lived there. <laughs> If you go to Mississauga, you, you, you'll see two, two tall towers. Did you, did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> God formed each of us just as we are. If you have questions about yourself, about your life, think of this fundamental truth about who God is and who you are. Hmm? Do you have the right to talk back to God? to question about what he's doing. If we are properly related to God, so we don't ask questions, we don't talk back to him. Remember, the power, ha the power has the complete control and authority of the clay. They, the shape of the vessel will be the shape the power intends and determines. Anybody who talks back to God and says, hmm, why should you blame me for my sin? It's all your fault. Only reveals that he really does not realize that God is God and man is man. God, as I said, God is the creator and man is creature. He is the everlasting spirit and man is uh, just dust of, dust of the earth, clay. God has every right to make us whatever shapes he wills. If you only consider God's glory, if you seek God's glory, glory, it does not matter <clears throat> how we have been shaped. The trouble begins the moment we seek our own glory, our own reputation, our own popularity. If you really seek God's glory, we are free from, from all this, all the troubles. If God wills to use one person to demonstrate his mercy and another to demonstrate his justice, then who are we to answer back? Because in fact, all of us deserve to be used to demonstrate God's justice. God knows what to do. God knows whom to choose. But it, that is not an irrational, arbitrary, or a capricious choice. He's not just picking numbers out of a hat. When he picks people, he makes no mistakes. What if God did this to make the riches of his glory known 
to the object of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. God chose some Jews, not the others, to give a double demonstration of his justice and mercy to other people who do not even belong to the Jewish race. God demonstrated both through them in order that we Gentiles, remember we are all Gentiles, everybody in this room, is, is there any Jew here? We are all Gentiles. We Gentiles might come to share not only the blessing, but also the curse set before us. This is nothing new. Paul shows that it is in line with the scriptures in Hosea and Isaiah. God called some Gentiles my people. Some who are not God's people would be called children of the living God. Many Jews who thought were God's chosen people, and his favorites, especially chosen by God, would not appreciate what God was doing to the Gentiles. Then Isaiah cried out concerning Israel. Though the number of the Israelites be like the sand by, by the sea, only the remnants will be saved. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like a Sodom. We would have been like a Gomorrah. If God treated the Jews as they really deserved, there would not be one Jew left alive today. Not only Jews, all actually everybody. There would be, no one would be alive. Out of his mercy, he kept some of them a remnant. He did this to make them the nucleus of his people and bring the Gentiles in with them. As Hosea had seen, Gentiles would become God's people. But God's people would still include some of the Jews, and together they would become the people of God. So we will expand this, this truth in chapter 11. Some of you may say, why are you talking so much about the Jews here? But if you really read prayerfully these three chapters, these three chapters are not so much about the Jews. These chapters give us a proper view of God and proper view of ourselves. After covering these chapters, I hope you will be able to say, God, you have a perfect right to do with uh, each person what you will. If you damn me, if you condemn me, it would be justice. If you choose me, then it is mercy. But I'll never talk back to you. You are righteous. Actually, I'd like to want everybody to close your eyes. I'd like to <coughs> finish with my prayer. <coughs> I'll continue and continue and then pray. I'll never back, talk back to you. You are righteous. You are just. You are fair. Whatever you do is right. I can praise you that you chose some of the Jews to inherit the promises, and you chose some Gentiles too, including me, to be part of the people of God. God, you are God. You are the creator. You are the power. I'm only, I'm only a creature. I'm the clay. Do whatever you think is best for your glory. God, I ask for your forgiveness. For many years, I really did not know who you are and who I was. I do not really know that I was clay. You are the power. I had so many questions. I talked back to you. I was bitter to you. I was resentful. I did not like the way you made me. I didn't like the way I was, uh, I, w I looked. I wished I could be someone else. But you chose to make me, create me, shape me the way, the way I was. Not to make me miserable, not to give me a hard time, 
but for your glory, to display your glory. Lord, I repent of my self-glory-seeking mentality. I thought uh, I should be in certain ways to be accepted by God, by people, to be more popular, to be more recognized. But you created me the way I was, even in my mother's womb. Apart from my desire, you had a wonderful purpose in my life. You had a wonderful purpose in each of your people here, sitting in your presence. Whether they like or not, whether they like what they are, the way they look, their character, their color, their personality, their even gender, their, their disposition, I believe, I trust you as the creator, part of, shaped each of the people here as you, you intended, as you determined, for a great purpose, for a good purpose, to reveal your glory, to display your glory in, in their lives, also in my life. Father, help us to really know that you have all the rights to, to do whatever you wishes, you desires, whatever you are pleased to do. So let us humbly, absolutely surrender to you, surrender to your will. Surely then you will reveal your glory. You will bless, uh, bless us. You will open our eyes to see your glory displayed, revealed in our lives. Father, thank you so much for choosing us, calling us, to be the vessel of your mercy. Even though we don't deserve, we only deserve to, to be the vessel of wrath. We are on the road to, to eternal destruction. Without your intervention, without your calling, without your choice, we, we would have gone the road continually and ended up in the burning fire of hell, set you forever separated from you. But you sent your son, your son, Jesus Christ. You let your son carry all our sins, all our curses. And then you gave us the status as your beloved children, sons and daughters. Father, help us to see ourselves from your perspective. Help us to see each of us, each others, from your viewpoint. So there, there would be no room for any pride, arrogance, and uh, conceit, boasting. Also, there, there would be no room for um, <coughs> indifference. Lord, give us uh, uh, godly sorrow, sorrow and uh, anguish and agony you gave to Paul. Actually, this is not just Paul. It is, it, it is uh, yours. You have such a sorrow, uns unceasing anguish when we think about the whole creation. <laughs> Even though we, we can rejoice over the salvation we received, we can rejoice and be very happy. Also, let us also think of uh, other people who are not in, in your will yet, in, who are not under your blessing. There are so many, thousands of them, even in, in this country, in this community, uh, on this earth. Use us as uh, your vessels, instruments to bring them into. Thank you so much for <coughs> giving us your words today. Um, may God continue to reveal the wonder your wonderful truth as we uh, read and study Romans, so we can really uh, see the whole picture of your your uh, redemptive history, and um, we can um, discover where we are and who we are in light of uh, your history. <coughs> Thank you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.